So we were just uh, talking about the fact that the, the New Testament makes it very clear that uh, Christians will continue to struggle with uh, the ravages of sin in their lives. And this pushes, oh, and indeed a number of great theologians throughout the centuries to reflect upon the psychology of indwelling sin. Augustine has a powerful way of, of putting this. Uh, he will talk about being a man divided against himself. Uh, remember, there's a great poem. I don't think A.E. Hausman was a Christian, but A.E. Hausman, the English poet, wrote a, a famous poem called The Welsh Marches, which starts with uh, the idea of a, of, of a battle between the English and the Welsh taking place on the uh, the English, the England-Wales border, and then moves into onto the realm of the human heart. And Hausman has uh, uh, a line, or a number of lines, where he says, uh, they cease not fighting east and west on the marches of my breast. They kill and kill and never die. And I think that each is I. The New Testament puts forth a picture of the Christian life that is one of uh, perpetual struggle when a person is united with Christ, when the Holy Spirit unites them to the Lord Jesus Christ, a contrary principle uh, is born in their soul, a desire to love and to serve God. But the old principle, the old man continues to live and a Christian is both a unity, continues to be one person, but is also a person often divided against themselves. That's why Paul talks about the good that he wants to do, that he does not do, and the evil that he does not want to do. That is what he ends up doing. The Christian is internally divided against themselves. Uh, and it's important, therefore, to understand the psychology of the old man who lives within uh, the breast. Paul will, well, Owen will talk uh, in great detail about this when he comes to talk about means of mortifying sin. I'm going to talk uh, in, in general terms just now and say one of the things that needs to be understood is uh, that the old man is utterly ruthless and comprehensive in his ambition. Uh, the old man seeks nothing less than the total destruction of the new man, and therefore, as we shall see later, that means that the Christian has to be equally ruthless and comprehensive in his opposition to the old man. But Owen goes on at great length about a number of the, 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 the things that, that come, that arise up out of this uh, old man within us, and he talks about how indwelling sin, uh, above all, can completely uh, distort our view of the world. Owen talks about it as a madness. He says this madness or rage is often accompanied with fearlessness and contempt of danger. It takes away the power of consideration and all that influence that it ought to have upon the soul. Hence, sinners that are wholly under the power of this rage are said to run upon God and the thick bosses of his buckler that wherein he's armed for their utter ruin. They despise the utmost he can do to them being secretly resolved to accomplish their lusts, though it cost them their souls. One of the things that Owen puts his finger on there, I think, is one of the, is, you know, the, the oddness that often takes place when Christians are in the grip of a particular sin. We, you know, sadly, many of us probably know somebody whose uh, Christian testimony, maybe even their livelihood, uh, was destroyed through some sin. Uh, how many men and women have uh, destroyed their marriages through acts of adultery that seem in retrospect to be completely insane? You know of a minister in uh, the PCA, a friend of mine, I'm, I'm not a friend of mine, I haven't spoken to him for a long time, but a couple of years ago uh, uh, left his wife and three children for a three-week affair with somebody in his church. Uh, and at the end of it, you know, he has no ministry left, uh, he has no marriage left, he has 
terrible financial problems descending on him because he's effectively torched his life. And one has to ask the question, why? It doesn't seem to be a particularly rational act, even if one takes Christianity out of the equation. Why would one do something like that in a way that has such devastating consequences for the whole of your life, for the rest of your life? And yet, people do that all the time. And one of the things that Owen puts his finger on is the madness that indwelling sin is fundamentally irrational And when it grasps the imagination, when it grips the imagination, people do fundamentally irrational things. People download pornography on their work computers and lose their jobs. Why? Even by the standards of the world, it seems an idiotic thing to do. Well, indwelling sin has as its aim the utter destruction of a person's soul and takes no account of rationality, therefore, as we understand it. So the first thing to note, Owen, would note about the psychology of indwelling sin is it is powerful to the extent that it will override all other rational considerations. Secondly, it feeds off external pressures. And here, I think, is is something that we we have to uh, take seriously into account. Going back to that anecdote of uh, Augustine and the stealing of the prayers, one of the things that Augustine makes very clear in his analysis of that act is he wouldn't have done it if he was on his own. He draws, he says, you know, laughter is generally speaking a corporate activity. Uh, Unfortunately, my wife hates it. I'm one one of those people who has the ability to laugh all by themselves. And sometimes it drives my wife crazy late at night when I suddenly think of a a joke or a line in a movie or something and I'll burst out laughing. And of course, it's doubly frustrating not only to be woken up by it, but not to be able to get the joke either. Uh, But Augustine points out that laughter is generally a communal activity. Things are funnier when you're watching, you know, a movie is funnier when you're watching it with somebody than it is when you're watching on your own. Can't explain exactly why. It just is that way. And Augustine says that much of the entertainment they got from putting one over on the neighbor came from the fact that he was with a bunch of pals. Uh, The father of two two sons, um, when they were younger, I I generally, I was never particularly worried when they were out on their own. Uh, It was when they were out with their pals that I got worried about what they might get up to. And their pals were all good people. But the, 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 the moral sum of a group of young men out together, uh, the, the sum of the whole is somewhat less than the sum of the parts, uh, one might say. Uh, indwelling sin capitalizes on external conditions. Paul, of course, will say, bad company corrupts morals. There is a social aspect to indwelling sin. And that means, of course, that when we come later to think about the solutions to it, there are external aspects to the mortification of sin. Uh, I was chatting to somebody recently about, uh, it was looking at, you know, looking at, been looking at pornography on the internet, and I, I said to them, well, have you, uh, have you put in place some um, software on your computer to try to block this stuff? Have you uh, linked up with Covenant Eyes to, to have an accountability person so that they can watch you? And he said, no, no, he said, I've, I, I don't want to do that because that would be legalism. And I'd never, he said, I would never know that I'd really beaten the sin if I did that. And I said, well, if you're an alcoholic, if you'd come to me and said, you know, Pastor, I keep getting drunk, uh, but you're working in a bar, and I said to you, you need to resign, you need to resign as a barman and go and stack shelves at, at Giant or Gennady's, what would you think of that advice? And he said, I think it'd be good advice. He said, you wouldn't think it'd be legalism. He said, no, because you've got to get out of the, the context. I said, well, that's what we're talking about here. There are external aspects to the fueling of indwelling sin. 
that need to be addressed. Uh, it's not legalism to do that. It's sanctified common sense because we know that indwelling sin as a principle can be fired up and exacerbated and triggered by external context. And so one has to think always about the context in which one is placing oneself. Uh, I was talking last night in the restaurant about uh, Christian freedom and things like this, and I make the point that certainly in, in my church, I'm never going to stand up and preach from the pulpit that Christians shouldn't drink alcohol or shouldn't smoke. I mean, particularly on smoking, strikes me as kind of silly, but I'm not sure that it's sinful. But I'm not going to start making general applications to everybody in my congregation on things like alcohol and tobacco. But I could anticipate a situation where I'm talking to an individual who's going out and getting drunk every night and saying to them, you need not to drink alcohol anymore. You need not to go to a bar. You need to avoid this because the psychology of your inner sin is such that put in a context like that, you know, a spark touches the blue touch paper, and then everything explodes. So there's a psychology to, in, uh, to indwelling sin that actually relates to external pressures. That also, I think, connects to group and peer pressure. As Paul says, bad company corrupts morals. The role of social frameworks is extremely important here. We need to remember the end game of indwelling sin. The end game is to defeat the will to good, to shipwreck the faith and the life of the believer. I've been preaching through Colossians, and at the end of Colossians, Paul ends by talking about, uh, well, passing on the greetings of various people that he's, uh, uh, he has in his entourage. If you'll turn with me to the end of Colossians, we can... Uh, look at just a couple of the names there, and there'll be good examples to you of different outcomes of the Christian life. Chapter 4, verse 10. Paul refers to Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Now, in uh, the Acts of the Apostles, Paul and Barnabas fall out over the status of Mark. Mark has withdrawn from them at some point. Mark has proved himself to be an unreliable co-worker for Paul. And Paul breaks with Barnabas over whether Mark should be part of the entourage or not. In 2 Timothy, Paul asks them to send Mark to him because he's very useful to him in his ministry. And the difference between uh, Acts and 2 Timothy is quite striking. But here is Mark. Mark who's failed and yet who has become useful to Paul at the end of his life in his ministry. A great reminder to us that failure is acceptable in some ways within Christianity because there are ways back from it. But another name that occurs in this chapter and again in 2 Timothy is that of Demas. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Demas also occurs in 2 Timothy, in the very chapter where Paul uh, asks for the former failure mark to be sent to him because he's useful to his ministry. We are told that Demas has deserted him in love with the things of this world. And those two names speak eloquently to us of the end game of indwelling sin. The end game of indwelling sin is to defeat the will to good, to shipwreck one's faith and the life of the believer and to bring the believer down. Yes, as Reformed Christians, we believe in the perseverance of the saints, but we are also to take the imperatives of the New Testament with a deadly seriousness. And we are also to understand the power and ambition of indwelling sin as a deadly, serious thing as well. So the end game, we should also understand one of the, the technique of indwelling sin. The technique of indwelling sin is above all things to distort our identity. As we come to understand what mortification is, central, I think, to Owen's understanding of mortification and indeed to Paul's understanding of mortification 
is identity. One of the, uh, one of the, 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 the good things, perhaps, about living in the era of identity politics that we do today is we perhaps have a more powerful sense of the importance of identity uh, in shaping the way we think and behave than ever before. You can hardly switch on the television these days without some kind of identity politics being pushed at you. The idea that because you are this person, because you are self-identify as this category, therefore certain behavior will flow from that. Paul, in his letters, continually hammers home Christian identity as the basis then for Christian activity and behavior. It is because you are who you are, it is because you know you are who you are, that you are therefore able to behave and to act in certain ways. Indwelling sin, the game of indwelling sin is to distort your identity. And anything that sin can, indwelling sin can get its hands on that will distort your identity is useful to it. I would suggest today one of the most powerful ways of that occurring is through the television. Uh, as Christians, we often worry most about sex and violence on the television. You know, we don't want to see stuff that we feel will make us enjoy sin or will uh, make us have thoughts, unbecoming thoughts that we shouldn't have. I think indwelling sin is much more subtle in the way that it appropriates the signals uh, from our culture. The analogy I make uh, for the television is you know, things like sex and violence on the television, what are they? Well, they're the equivalent of looking out of your window on a Saturday morning. You can hear a noise down the street, you look out of your window, and there is somebody walking down the street wearing a, a, hockey, uh, a hockey goalie mask with a chainsaw, which has blood dripping from it. Uh, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to lock your door and you're going to phone the police. You're going to want the guy taken out as soon as possible. The danger is obvious. If you go out into the street, you're going to get dismembered by a lunatic with a chainsaw. You don't have to be a genius to spot that one. You lock your door and you sit in your door, you sit inside and you're dead within half an hour. Why? Because your heating system's malfunctioning and it's pumping carbon monoxide into your house. And you can't even, you don't even know there's a problem until it's too late. Carbon monoxide, I'm told, is scentless. You can't tell that it's there. It's why we have to have carbon monoxide alarms uh, in our houses to keep us safe. Those are the more deadly aspects of culture from the perspective of indwelling sin. And if indwelling sin is in the game of changing your understanding of who you are in order then to be able to fundamentally transform your kind of behavior, you need to be aware of the things that are coming to you from the culture that change your understanding of who you are. And I would suggest that commercials are probably far more deadly and far more dangerous to most people and most families than sex and violence. Why? Because you can see the sex and violence, it's obvious, and you can press the off switch. You can avoid it. Commercials send subliminal signals. What is the basic message of a commercial? Buy this and your life will be more fulfilled. Buy this and you will achieve a level of human perfection that you don't currently enjoy. Let's do the Augustine thing on that and take that back a stage and say, what is that message fundamentally sending to us? What is the, what is the basic message being sent there? You are God. You can create yourself. You can be anything you want to be. You can buy this thing and you can change who you are in some fundamental way. And guess what? That's exactly the message that indwelling sin loves to hear because it can capitalize on. The basic message of a purpose of indwelling sin is to change your understanding of your own identity, to make you think that you are God. And when commercials come at you from the outside, they sing exactly that tune and fuel exactly that thought within your mind. So identity is very, very important, and the world is very, very effective at reinforcing indwelling sin, understanding of who you are, by sending external 
signals. And this brings, of course, Owen to his famous statement on mortification. Be killing sin or it will be killing you. For Owen, there is an imperative to mortification that has to be taken seriously. When it comes to sin, there is no standing still. You're either moving forwards or you're moving backwards. There is no point of standing still on the issue of the mortification of sin for Owen. Indwelling sin is so powerful, so comprehensive in its ambitions that putting it to death is a perpetual duty and something that one has to do continuously. Owen will say in his work on mortification, uh, uh, mortification is a duty prescribed. It is a duty prescribed to particular people. It comes with a promise. It is rooted in a cause. And it connects to a condition. We will come to all of those things later. I think first of all, we perhaps need to reflect on what mortification is not. If mortification is an imperative, if we are to put to death the deeds of the body, then we need to understand what it is. And the first thing, I think, the first step in doing that is to understand what mortification is not. How are you going to do? How are you going to go about killing sin? Well, first of all, you can't do it this way. Mortification of sin is not the replacement of one sin with another. Um, I think often we can, we can make that mistake. Mortification of sin is a comprehensive category. It does have particular manifestations and instances, but replacing one sin with another is not mortification. A silly example. Uh, if I were to say, if I, were, if I had a congregant who was uh, struggling with going out and getting drunk every night, and I bump into him, I, have a, I actually have a code for, for members of my congregation when they're struggling with something like that. My code on a Sunday, because you know, I can't go up and ask them directly about the, uh, the intimate details of their lives in front of everybody. Typically what I'll do is I'll go up and say, have you had a good week? and look them in the eye, and they know that that's my code for asking them a very specific question. And I want a simple yes or no answer. Don't want a description of the week. I'm asking a particular question. There are particular sins. If I were to go up to somebody who'd been struggling, let's say, because they've been going out every night and getting drunk, and I say to that person, have you had a good week? And they say to me, yes, I went out and robbed a bank every night instead. <laughs> I would say... That's a problem. That's, that's not mortification. I think so often we can make the mistake of assuming that not committing a particular sin and replacing it with something we perceive to be a more minor sin is somehow what Paul is talking about when he talks about putting to death the deeds of the body. It's not that at all. Sanctification is not simply replacing one lot of sins with a different lot of sins. Mortification is not getting rid of one sin and slotting another one in its place. Nor is mortification the mere outward conformity to a law. Again, uh, this, can be, this can be hard sometimes for us to culturally accept. Uh, I was talking to somebody recently who was confessing what they considered to be a, a, a fairly bad sin and addiction to me. And he was clearly a very uh, broken and distressed person in this context. And so I felt it was appropriate to... Uh, in this particular instance, it was appropriate to relativize his sin to some extent. Not to relativize sin in an absolute sense, but at least to, to make him realize that this sin uh, seemed particularly bad in his eyes because it carried a certain sort of social stigma with it. It was not particularly a biblical stigma, if I could put it that way. And I asked him, uh, which is the sin 
in the New Testament, which we're told, or in the Bible, we're told on several occasions that God actively opposes. You know, we, we know that God disapproves of all sin, but there's one in sin in particular that's singled out repeatedly on the grounds that God actively opposes this sin. It's pride. Pride. Uh, ironically, of course, pride is probably one of the more socially acceptable sins uh, today. You know, didn't I say earlier on, everybody, you know, have you ever met a child who wasn't awesome these days? Everybody's child's awesome. Uh, uh, it was uh, commented that, that 30 years ago it would have been regarded as, uh, this article I was reading, people would have regarded as socially inept if they'd told people how intelligent their children were when they were asked how the family was. Now it kind of goes with the territory. Somebody asks how your kids are and you've got to tell them all about their grades at school if they're grades to be proud of. If they're not, you probably divert the conversation to some area where you can uh, be proud of them. Proud of them. Pride. Now, taking pleasure in somebody's success is not necessarily pride. Pride is really placing yourself in, in, in the, uh, the place of God. But mere outward conformity to a law, simply stopping looking at certain websites, that's not necessarily mortification. Where's your mind going? How's your pride doing? Mortification is not simply outward conformity. Christ himself drives this point home, does he not, in the Sermon on the Mount, where he makes it very clear that it's a moral psychology which is just as guilty as any act we might care to perform. And thirdly, and this perhaps touches more directly upon some of the things that are going on in the Reformed Evangelical world today. Mortification and sanctification are not simply coming to a deeper and deeper appreciation of one's justification. And some of you may not have come across this, some of you may have done so, but there is a powerful stream of thinking out there at the moment that sees sanctification as simply one's increasing realization of how, fall one, how short one falls of the standards of God. I certainly think that's part of the Christian life, a growing appreciation of the holiness of God and the gap that exists between us and God. But Paul makes it clear that there are to be things done as a result of our identity in Christ. Deeds are to be mortified. The New Testament also includes threats and conditions. Paul's answer isn't simply to continually push people back to think about Christ. That's part of the answer. But there are also some imperatives that are driven home and warnings that are given. Uh, why is it that Anan the story of Ananias and Sapphira is in the book of Acts? I think it's there as a terrible warning that God is not mocked. Mortification is not simply a reflection upon our justification. Yes, that is certainly a part of it. As we shall see when we come to reflect on Paul in Colossians, Paul roots much of his discussion in the uh, identity of believers in Christ. But he goes on in Colossians to give some fairly specific directions. He doesn't say, husbands and wives, just reflect upon what Christ has done for you. He says, husbands love your wives. Wives submit to your husbands. Children, obey your parents. Parents, do not exacerbate your children. Exasperate your children. Paul does more than simply point to our justification in Christ. That brings us then to, well, if that is what mortification is not, if it is not the replacement of one sin with another, if it is not mere outward conformity to a law, if it is not merely reflecting upon our justification, well, what is it? Well, the command to mortify is found perhaps supremely in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. And I want to spend a little time on Colossians before returning to the Apostle Paul, 
Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5 reads as follows. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave-free, but Christ is all and in all. Here in Colossians, we get the great... Uh, I, think, I think Colossians is... It's a neglected letter because it's, you know, people focus on Philippians and Ephesians, perhaps. But Colossians lays out for us the framework for mortification. I think as we find it nowhere else in the New Testament. Underlying it is Paul's argument that in Christ, a new age has come. Paul talks in Colossians about Christ dying and rising. And in Pauline theology, that marks a transition between the old age and the new age. Christ is the firstborn from the dead. We know that in the past there were little resurrections. The Shunammite son, Lazarus. But the Shunammite son eventually died. Lazarus eventually died. Christ's resurrection is epoch-making. He's the firstborn from the dead. He rises with an immortal body that will never die. Something fundamental happens when Christ rises from the dead that changes everything. And this underlies Paul's arguments in Colossians. As he moves in Colossians towards uh, laying out the moral imperatives, the imperative of mortification for believers, at the back of his mind is the two ages. We might say the age of Adam and the age of Christ. Which one is the Christian identified with? Why well, is with the age of Christ? And Paul uses dramatic language to describe the power of this age. Elsewhere in the New Testament, so Paul will berate those who've said that the resurrection has happened. Say, so, you know, the resurrection hasn't happened. The res people that say the resurrection, they're wrong. In Colossians, though, he uses past tense. When he talks about the Colossian Christians, he talks about they have died and risen with Christ. Clearly, he's using resurrection. In, he's playing with it a bit here. He's not contradicting himself. What he's saying is there is a very real sense in which the believer here and now, identified with Christ by faith, has died and risen. There is something powerful and significant that has taken place in the believer's life as they identify with Christ. You have passed from the age of Adam to the age of Christ. And that lies in the background then of what Paul says here about mortification. Notice verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Now, some throughout church history have interpreted that as meaning, as a sort of justification for kind of asceticism. Put to death that which reflects one's physical appetites. We see this in the, the ascetics of the, the Middle Ages. Um, uh, the flagellants who would whip themselves. Uh, I love you know, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. You know, the flagellants, they walk along, they bash their heads against those uh, uh, pieces of wood as, as a sort of penance. There's this idea that putting to death what is earthly somehow re re you know, refers to the physical world. Well, that's not what Paul is talking about here at all. What Paul is talking about here, of course, is what belongs to the old age of Adam. Paul draws a contrast between earthly and heavenly. Set your minds on things that are above. Set your minds on things of the age of Christ, the resurrection that is to come. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, what belongs to the old age. You've died and been resurrected with Christ. Now remember, of course, you have and you haven't. There's a sense in which you've died and been resurrected with Christ by identifying with him by faith. But you're still going to die. Christ doesn't return, you and I are still going to die. We haven't yet died and been resurrected as we will at the end of time. So there's a sense in which the old age still has a kind of hole on us. That's where indwelling sin comes in. 
Indwelling sin, we might say in Pauline terms, is that which in us that wants to tell us we belong to the old age, that wants to drag us continually back to the old age. And Paul here, knowing that, says, put to death, take on with all your might everything within you that wants to drag you back to the old ways of doing things. And it's interesting uh, that the list of sins Paul uh, lays out here. You know, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire. Those four uh, things essentially cover, kind of, they, they all have sexual connotations, if you like. And then he says covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness could also have that sort of sexual aspect, coveting your neighbor's wife or husband, but also has materialist aspects to it. I'm inclined to say, that's a brilliant list Paul puts out there. That's basically everything, isn't it? The two basic problems. Almost all human sin can be reduced to sex or greed. It basically covers everything. Not just you know, the, the, the sins of teenage boys. You know, we become more sophisticated as we get older, but essentially, all of our sins fall into those two categories. And then Paul is interesting, of course, he throws in that word idolatry, which is idolatry. Uh, my colleague at Westminster, Greg Beale, has done a lot of work on idolatry, image of God and idolatry. Picking up on Psalm 115. Remember in Psalm 115, the, the psalmist talks there about <clears throat> the idolaters, they make these images, they make these statues, and they look like the real thing. They have eyes, they have ears, they have mouths, but they can't see, they can't hear, and they can't speak. And then the punchline comes in, those who make them will be like them. In other words, you take on the image of that which you worship. Here we have idolatry. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Paul is pointing here to the fact that these things speak powerfully of our identity. There is a sense in which we become what we worship. And these things belong to the old age. And in indulging in them, we become like them. We maintain, we retain, we intensify the image of the old age. So the imperative then is here, we need to live as those who have been brought into the new age. It also reminds us, I think, of the power of identity in mortifying. It's a battle for our identity. Uh, don't think of it primarily in sort of legalistic terms. Think of Sanctification, think of mortification in terms of a battle for our identity. To whom do we belong? To Adam or to Christ? To the old age or to the new? If we live by the sins that Paul has laid out here, if we live by these patterns, then we identify ourselves with the old order. I love the uh, phrase, one commentator on this passage, uh, E. Schweitzer, not Albert Schweitzer, a different Schweitzer, says, when man has lost God, he is at the mercy of all things because his own covetousness takes the place of God. If you're greedy for material things, whether it's sexual experiences, money, or power, then that is idolatry because it robs God of his place in your life as the one who provides you with your fundamental identity. It's one made in his image. And Paul now lays out here a number of motives for uh, mortification. First of all, notice the wrath of God. Paul says... Uh, Verse 6, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Paul, I think, is pointing there towards uh, 
the final judgment. The wrath of God is coming against the things of the old age. At the end of time, the things of the old age will be subject to the wrath of God. There are a number of spin-off uh, inferences we can, we can take for this. Uh, remember, of course, God is not a, a capricious or arbitrary tyrant. Biblical history shows that God is more often merciful than one who exacts the full penalty. And notice, too, that this is not simply the natural outworking of an act of rebellion. Paul is not saying, your rebellion here, you know, it's like stepping off a tall building. You're going to plunge to your death because of the laws of gravity. Paul is saying, the wrath of God, the wrath of a personal holy God is coming against these things. He's coming against those who deliberately contravene his will and desire to offend against his person. But notice also that Paul seems to be talking about this in the context of the church. It goes back to that point I made earlier. I think those who try to argue that the whole motivation for sanctification is simply a justification or that sanctification can simply be reduced to deeper and deeper reflection on our justification, much as that teaching, I think, may appeal to an overindulged world that likes to think it's going to be indulged by God, does not do justice to what the New Testament says. Paul puts into the mix here that the wrath of God is coming against these things in the context of talking about them within the church. That is... One motive that Paul lays out here. The other motive, of course, you could say, is that of the new humanity. What is the other reason why Paul calls on the Colossians to mortify uh, their sins? Well, it comes, does it not, in verse 11. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. It goes back to what I started off the, talking about this morning. The great biblical stereotypes. Adam and Christ. Whatever divides the people in Colossae in terms of their cultural particularities, the overwhelming thing about them is what they hold in common. They're identified with Christ. Not only that, but they're identifying with Christ. They're part of a new humanity. All of those Incidental distinctives are swept away in comparison to their identity with Christ. There is to be a new humanity, and that is to be the basis for mortification, for the putting to death of sins. There is an individual aspect to this, the renewal of the image of God within each of us as individuals. But there is a corporate aspect. Notice what Paul says lays out here. These are all corporate things. He doesn't say, here there is no Andy or Simon or Dave or Pete. He says there's not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. These are all corporate categories. There's a new humanity. There is a corporate identity that is of profound importance for us. So Paul in Colossians then, the key text on mortification in Colossians, Paul emphasizes the importance, I think, of, of two things. One, our identity in the Lord Jesus Christ, and two, the transition that has taken place between the old and the new in the work of Christ. That is to be the foundation for us putting, together, putting to death our sins in Christ. The present. Going back to Owen then. Owen picks up on this and how does he see this as playing out? Well, we're going to talk in more detail in the next lecture on specific things that need to be done. But, Paul, uh, but Owen sees numerous things flowing from Paul in general. The Christian is to be utterly ruthless in their mortification of sin. Paul is not here talking about individual things. It's a comprehensive new age that Paul is looking to. And therefore, Christians need to be ruthless and comprehensive in the way they deal with sin. We are not to focus on mortifying any individual sin to the expense of any others. 
The mortification of sin is to be done ruthlessly and with a great comprehensiveness. It is to target anything which makes the earthly the ultimate object of our love. We are to focus on heavenly things only by reflecting upon Christ and the things above do we have the foundation for dealing with sins in the here and now. Owen also points out the fact that only a believer can therefore mortify sins. Unless a man be a believer, Owen says, that is one that is truly engrafted into Christ, he can never mortify any one sin. I do not say unless he know himself to be so, but, indeed, but unless indeed he be so. The business of the unbeliever for Owen is conversion, not the mortification of sin. It's interesting we could sort of play around with that a bit and think that what Owen is really saying there is that the unbeliever does not struggle with sin as the believer does. That is not to say that an unbeliever can't do things that that make them feel dirty or divided against themselves. Made in the image of God, all know that they are accountable to God in some to some extent. All know right from wrong to some extent, however distorted that sense has been. So all can know shame and guilt and dirtiness. But only the believer, according to Owen, truly knows the struggle between the old age and the new that takes place in the believer's breast. Um, it is interesting that one of the criticisms of the church is, you know, the church is so full of hypocrites. Uh, I was with uh, somebody last week and heard them, they were preaching on, on that topic and said, yeah, the amazing thing is, well, the world is full of hypocrites too. But nobody ever seems to use that as a basis for discrediting the world. I mean, you only have to look at uh, your typical politicians. And politicians, I don't think, are, I don't think they're a particularly hypocritical species. I think politicians are just scrutinized more closely than the rest of us. And therefore, their hypocrisies are brought out more dramatically than those of the rest of us. But one only has to look at the political world to see the level of hypocrisy there is. The difference between the church and the world is not that they're hypocrites and we are. The difference, I think, is often that we know we're hypocrites and we know that we are meant to do something about it and we have the resources to do something about it at our disposal. Owen also points to the fact that mortification is a constant activity. It is not something that one does and then stops. Mortify the sins of the earth, the deeds of the flesh, is a continual command. Um, again, one of the things I found uh, that, strangely, people that I've talked to in church have found most encouraging, and that is when you meet somebody who's struggling with a particular sin, when you say to them, you know, you're probably going to be struggling with this for the rest of your life. Uh, you're going to have to get up every morning and decide that you're going to put this one to death that day. Uh, and it may not get easier. And strange to tell, some have found that very liberating. Because they've been in churches where they've been told, do this, do that, and it will go away, and it will get better, and you'll find yourself lifted to a higher plane. And it never happens. And when it never happens, that is a distressing, a disillusioning thing. Owen makes it very clear that the fight against sin is to be constant. Uh, the sins of one's youth, very often the same sins, or well, certainly of one's middle age, I can't yet speak of old age. Uh, some of you maybe can comment on that, but it seems to me that the sins I struggle with today are pretty much the sins I struggled with the day that I was converted 30, 30 odd years ago. And finally, and this is before we come to, uh, we'll come next time to some specific uh, instructions that Owen gives. There must be a universality of intention in mortification. Owen says this, without sincerity and diligence in a universality of obedience, there is no mortification of any one perplexing lust to be obtained. 
A man finds any lust to bring him into the condition formerly described. It is powerful, strong, tumultuating, leads captive, vexes, disquiets, takes away peace. He is not able to bear it, wherefore he sets himself against it, prays against it, grows under it, sighs to be delivered. But in the meantime, perhaps in other duties, in constant communion with God, in reading, prayer, and meditation, in other ways that are not of the same kind with the lust wherewith he is troubled, he is loose and negligent. Let not that man think that ever he shall arrive to the mortification of the lust. He is perplexed with all. We'll come to that in the final lecture. What Owen is saying there is there has to be a comprehensive Christian life in place for any individual sin to be dealt with in any remotely effective way. Okay, we'll take a break. Is it 15 minutes this time, Stan? Okay, we'll take a slightly longer break this time and then we'll come back to start talking about some specific guidance that Owen gives.